Well, a very good afternoon to each and every one of you for joining us here today. We're quite excited to have you for our virtual engagement, which is certainly going to focus on Money Hacks for Generation Hustle, brought to you by NetBank Young Professionals. My name is Kukule Tumfupi, and I'm quite excited to be with you over the next hour. I'm not alone. I certainly have three amazing guests with us who will assist all of us as young professionals who are active participants in this economy. We're young, we're keen, and we're eager not only to fill our dreams, but also to make sure that uh, as we do that, we are able to unlock greater leadership skills within ourselves, able to tap into the multiple talent pools that we're able to uh, enrich ourselves in, and most importantly, create a life of comfort, of leisure, and of course, filled with experiences that money affords us the opportunity to indulge in. And that's why today we'll be uh, sharing some money hacks with you as members of Generation Hustle each of you who even through the midst of the pandemic are still active participants in South Africa's economy and most importantly fulfilling your own ambitions and that also having a positive impact on the lives of those that you live with. Well I want to remind you that we're quite excited to have you with us here today in conversation and that we want to invite you with us to journey with us as we learn more insight from our speakers and the insight that they'll be able to share. One thing that we have certainly made sure we do is to have you actively participate as we always do. We're well aware that we're in a virtual world, but that does not limit the amount of interaction that we can engage on. And this is where we'd like you to actively share your thoughts. You can share your questions by typing into the chat service and uh, ensuring that you uh, actually elaborate perhaps on your background, uh, the thoughts that you'd like us to bring up here in conversation as we do explore money hacks for Generation Hustle. Another element that we're quite keen on is that there will be lots of learnings that will be shared throughout this conversation. And this is where we want you to spread the word and not limit the insight and the input just to ourselves here at the table, but really ensure that you also share your voice on social media by uh, using the following hashtags. Hashtag NetBankYoungPro, hashtag NetBankYoungPro, and of course be sure to uh, include some of the comments that will be shared by some of the speakers who join us here today, right here as we live from NetBank's headquarters in Santon, Johannesburg, South Africa. Well, I trust that you're excited. If this were a real audience, I'd ask you to uh, put your hands together for a round of applause. Maybe whistle if you have to. And because we're South African, ululating might also be welcomed. But I guess you can express all of that through the chat service as you uh, share your excitement to be with us here today. Without further ado, allow me to introduce our speakers to you and uh, share brief backgrounds as to who they are, their level of expertise, and of course, brief insight into the areas that we'll be discussing uh, into with them very shortly. Starting off to my left, uh, futurist and a woman who knows everything to do with the future, and she does all of that without having to look into a crystal ball or maybe even throwing some bones. But uh, to my left, we have Bronwyn Williams. Bronwyn is a futurist, economist, and business trends analyst. Bronwyn has over a decade's experience in strategic management, trend research and foresight, consulting to clients in the public and private sector across the African continent. Part economist and part strategist, Bronwyn's particular area of expertise include fintech trends, alternative economic models, and sustainable future design. You sound like you have a fantastic job for the future, Bronwyn. We're quite excited to have you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Fantastic. Looking forward to your insight shortly. To my right, we have Kensani Nobanda. While her blood is green <laughs> through and through, as Kensani is the group executive of uh, marketing as well as corporate affairs at NetBank. Her marketing career spans more than 18 years, working across a number of local and multinational organizations. Kensani is passionate about brands, especially brands that are purpose-led and embody that purpose in everything that they do. Well, she'll bring her unique experience as a woman in leadership in the corporate world, both here and abroad, to the round table. So again, warmly welcoming you, Kensani, and looking forward to your insight. Thanks, Gugu. Thank you for having me. Indeed. I must say, as a banker, I'm quite impressed you're uh, not dressed as a banker in grey, <laughs> right? <laughs> Surely showing us that you're bringing a lot of insight and spirit and, uh, uh, I guess, energy to the table, certainly, today. And, of course, to the far right-hand side is Nikki Bush. Nikki is a renowned author and human potential expert. She empowers individuals, families, and teams in businesses and education to win at work, home, and life. Nikki makes future-proofing, dealing with loss and adversity, team dynamics, self-leadership, parenting skills, all more accessible. She'll also share some money hacks for women and hashtag young pros to keep us driving onwards 
in these uncertain times and we'll certainly delve into how best we can future proof ourselves. Nikki, such a pleasure to engage with you again. Thanks, Gugu. Lovely to be here. Indeed. Well, I'm quite excited and I think many of you can tell. So keep that excitement coming in. A reminder that we also are able to take your questions and in a moment we'll get towards them uh, towards the end of the conversation, but keep them streaming in. We are able to see them and Nompumelelo, you've certainly set the theme and the conversation going. So thank you for your feedback. We'll be sure to give you some insight into your questions in just a moment. Share the moments on, and experiences again on social us as we really look to uh, unpack some of the money hacks that we need to be mindful of. Well, as we start the conversation, Bronwyn, I'd like perhaps to start off with you. Um, as the futurist, it almost feels <laughs> as though we're living in the future right now, right? Almost 18 months of living within a pandemic, working and operating from home. Uh, and I guess for many of us, we almost feel the sense that, you know, this has certainly been a tumultuous time, particularly for women. Um, to be involved in when it comes to economic opportunities that we participate in. I guess we've been saying it for quite a while. Is the future here and are we living <laughs> in, uh, I guess, these unpredictable times, primarily as uh, professional females? Well, the future is always starting right now and it's always veering out into a sort of much more fuzzy distance the further we get. But we have to understand that it is always starting right now. It's not just something that you just arrive at or something that you leave. But there is also a sense that for quite a lot of us, we've had to abandon certain versions of the future that we thought that we were going to have. And there's quite an interesting term that I've been speaking quite a lot about lately, a term known as nostalgia, which is almost the opposite of nostalgia. So nostalgia is hankering after a past that you can't go back to. Mm -hmm. Postalgia is the sort of sense of longing for a future that you can no longer have. So it's all those dreams we've had to put on pause or change a bit, but it's also a time for reflection. So if we're able to get out of that sense and refocus on the present as a starting point for a more pragmatic future, then we're in quite a good space. I think that's a valid point that you raise. Not only are you teaching us something new, postalgia, but is it valid, right? Because a lot of us do feel as though we've carved out these careers, we had plans for the year ahead and boom, mm -hmm. this pandemic is still with us. So I guess, is it warranted that we do feel that way? Yes, absolutely, of course it is. And there is a certain period of grieving over that version of ourself that we are working towards that we might have to then change a bit. But the trick is to not get stuck in that space. Mm. So yes, take the time, grieve over what you've had to let go of, grieve for the very real losses that many of us have felt, but also those losses of those potential use that you could have been, but don't get stuck there. Much like with nostalgia, it's fine to look back and to remember your past with pleasure, but if we start living in the past, then we miss out on the presence and we miss out on being able to direct our course going forward. So take the time, mourn that loss, but then recenter and replan as to where you're headed next. Mm -hmm. Very important, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. Kansani, I am keen to get your thoughts as an icebreaker, especially in terms of the concept and theme around leadership, right? For many people who work in corporate spaces, they have the luxury of having been able to plan out and carve out their careers, you know, evolving and getting promoted to certain positions. But uh, as we can tell, as Bronwyn has explain, explained, and as many of us have witnessed, it's not always that easy. But uh, I guess in terms of your experience, have you endured adversities before that might have, you know, in, resulted in your career not shaping out as you might have initially thought? Sure, absolutely. I always say it's easy to look at the Kenzie now and think, oh, that looks easy enough, right? Oh, like, perfect life. But it's perfect, but it's actually not. I always speak about a very personal experience that happened to me in 2011 when I took a six-month break from working. And I needed that because, I mean, Google was so bad, I would actually watch my own TV ads and fast forward them. That's how much I hated my job. And a, a big part of it was my manager at that time who I'd, I'd, I was living in Dubai and I'd been doing this job for about two years, had a great time doing it. I was traveling all over the world. And then I got a new boss who was incredibly ambitious and good for him. Right. But in his ambition, he was stamping on a lot of people. Mm. And for a long time, I took it. But, you know, my body wasn't reacting well. I started I'm a star generally in my career and I started not being a star, you know, and all of that. And then. Just one day, I just said to myself, no way, I'm not accepting this. And I needed to reconnect with myself. So I actually took a six month break from working. I moved back to South Africa. I, I, you know, I traveled a little bit, like I climbed mountains in Ethiopia just to center myself. Wow. And I moved in with my parents. And I literally, I mean, how old was I? I was 32 years old. And I said, mom, dad, I'm coming home. <laughs> like, and I was okay with it. And you know, even just, you think oh, you're gonna be sort of embarrassed around your friends. I actually was very clear as to why I was doing it. And what happened after that is actually, 
I feel like my career had a lot more focus after the break. I knew exactly what I wanted and I knew what I didn't want. So in two organizations before I came to NetBank where I was experiencing the thing that I didn't want, I didn't stay because I was now clear what worked and what didn't work mm. for me. So yeah, absolutely. It's not, there'll always be ups and downs. It's how you get out of it, right? That's more important. Exactly. Yeah. And that tells us something certainly about self-awareness. As you say, you know what you don't want, yeah. even though you're working towards what it is that you want. And that's a very important lesson that perhaps we, we tend to forget. Would you say that that is a, I guess, a life hack that we can share with Generation Hustle that's listening here today? Oh my goodness, absolutely. Like in this, I'm not going to mention the name of the organization where I was expected to act in a particular way. And if I didn't, I wouldn't get a promotion. And I was like, well, no, that doesn't work for me. Yeah. Because actually, if you think about it, what are you going to be remembered for, right? Like, it's, it's not going to be because you were so unhappy in your job. Like, or oh, is that what you want to be remembered for? I don't. I want to have, you spoke earlier on when you introduced this, Google, and you were talking about, um, you know, we want to build meaningful lives, but, you know, great lives with, like, you know, like living well and yes. all of that. Living well also means in your heart and your soul and physically everything must connect. And for me, my job becomes a big part of that. And if my job detracts from that, that doesn't work for me. So perhaps if I could you know, advise anyone, be very clear what doesn't work for you as much as what you want and what works for you. Mm -hmm. Very clear. And we'll come back to that in just a moment because it really does help expand in terms of self-actualization as well as uh, leadership roles that many of us are fulfilling, especially our audience as young professionals in mm -hmm. the environment. Nikki, I'm quite excited to hear from you because you also have a book here that you've published <laughs> called Future Proof Yourself, which we'll delve into in just a moment. But I guess to set the theme uh, and of course perhaps highlight some of the lessons uh, that, that we've shared about the future and the uncertainty, the importance of actually understanding that um, things sometimes don't go according to plan and one needs to be comfortable with that, that naturally speaks to a messaging that we also need to land with our, our younger audience who perhaps are bright, full of promise, but yet so anxious about the future. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, life does not unfold in a straight line, not for you, not for me, not for anybody. And it doesn't unfold in a straight line when you're 50 or when you're in your 20s to 30s. So it doesn't matter where you are in life. Change is constant. And you spoke about gaps, you know, gap years, gap six months, whatever it is. I love gaps, gaps for growth. So I'd you know, like to land that as a message, mm -hmm. that gaps for growth can be critical to your advancement. And growth doesn't have to be forwards all the time. It can be sideways. Mm. And so never, ever underestimate the power of a sideways move. And when we go through disruption of any kind, change of any kind, it does feel uncomfortable. Yeah. But something I learned early on in my career is if you're uncomfortable, you're probably growing. Mm. So we need to look at this pandemic, this disruption that's impacted on every single one of us in many different ways as this growth gap, mm. this reinvention gap, we are seeing possibilities and opportunities now that we couldn't see before because our lives have been turned upside down. Yep. So we can get a different perspective. So I think the message that's really important, and Ron, when you alluded to it with your nostalgia and your nostalgia, is perspective. If we get freaked out by change and disruption. It's kind of like we're too close to the window pane mm -hmm. and we have no perspective. Then you can't see the opportunities and the possibilities. So we can talk a little later on about some practical things we can do to be able to step back and see the collateral damage versus the collateral beauty. Because I promise you, there is tons of positive stuff out there if you can see it. Yeah, that's important to be able to see it and identify it and work through it. Uh, and I, I'm going to build up on that to actually say we're quite cognizant of the fact that this is a Women's Day webinar, given that it is the last day of August, uh, while celebrated as Women's Month in South Africa. And perhaps that's also a key lesson that women often need to learn, because year after year, we constantly talk about having more women at the table, gender parity being a key feature. Are these particular nuances that you believe more young women also need to implement within their professional careers? I think that in your 20s to 30s, if you can put down some really solid foundations to give you options moving forward, that's what you need to be going mm -hmm. for. And that means that your, your career track record is important and every little bit of experience counts. Even those bits that you don't think are that important, I right. promise you they are. And you need to put down 
foundations for your financial track record. So your creditworthiness, for example. Do you pay that cell phone bill every single month on time? Mm -hmm. Do you pay your rent every month on time? Because that's how you create that credit track record that's going to open up options and possibilities for you later on. And that's very linked to your life plan and your career development. So leaving that as you know your track record, the path you leave behind is how you get to here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Wherever here may be. And, and today, none of us have never been here before. We're all co-creating the future as we speak, which is actually quite exciting. Exactly. Nothing's a given anymore. Nothing's a given, which, as you say, is exciting, but oh, certainly does fill us with uh, slight does. levels of anxiety. anxiety but I think, yeah. as everyone has highlighted in the conversation here today, there is beauty in, in terms mm -hmm. of uh, the opportunities that do exist uh, in the market. Well, we're quite excited and hoping that you are continuing to absorb a lot more of the insight that we're going to share with you. Uh, and, of course, sharing some of that messaging on social media. The official hashtag to use is NetBankYoungPro, where we are giving you money hacks, and you can call them life hacks to uh, help you uh, as you grow uh, along your journey in terms of uh, building yourself into a uh, key professional who can contribute not only to the economy, but also fulfill the many aspects of your life that you'd like to live fully. Uh, and perhaps as we continue with these money hacks as well as suggestions and recommendations as to how do you build that legacy, how do you lay that foundation, it's probably best for us to start from a leadership point of view. Uh, and Kansani, this is where I'm hoping you can help us peel back at the many layers of young professionals who might be working in corporate and some of the leadership lessons that they need to implement in their lives. Mm -hmm. For many, when we start off in a job, it's always taught, told that you need to find a mentor, mm -hmm. someone who will hold your <laughs> hand, who will guide you, and uh, avoid some of the mistakes that you actually need to repeat um, uh, in order to gain some traction in your career. Perhaps give them some, some insight into the mentors you had in your life and the impact that they had on your professional career. And if in hindsight, if there's anything you do differently in terms mm. of that relationship. So it's an interesting question because I think for most people, when you say, um, who was your mentor, they just tell you. But I actually never really had that. And I'll speak maybe to two, maybe personal mentors, but it speaks to, so one of my purpose in terms of my job, right, is I want to make sure that young black women have got the possibility of having millions of mentors that include other black women. Because when I grew up, I didn't have that. I grew up as a young girl in Swaziland. I mean, who was going to, you know what I mean, right? Yeah. But there were two things I think that were important. So first was my grandmother. My grandmother was married to a Portuguese businessman who used to, traveled quite a bit. So she ended up having to, in a sense, raise her seven children, including my mom, on her own. And she had a small store in a, in a market which used to sell to tourists. And so every time for holidays, I loved going to my grandmother's because I would be selling you know, all these knickknacks to all these tourists. And the reason I loved it was for two things. One, I got to experience that the world was bigger than Swaziland, right? Like I got to chat to all these tourists um, and you know, just you know, and two, my grandmother gave me the confidence. She made me the face of like a little store because because oh, really? I could speak English. So she's like, okay, go speak to the tourists and stuff. And then I was also learning French at the time, so I did French as my second language. I'd also practice French, so it gave me the confidence of just at a young age being able to not be scared of talking to people, addressing people, or you know, anything. So I think you know, massive mentor of mine. The second one was actually my mom, which is a bit of a cliche, but I'll, I, specifically I'll tell you why, and I think it goes to money hacks. I always laughingly tell people that, you know, as a black kid, were you ever taught that you should, you know, spend less than you earn? I don't know, we were never taught how to budget, okay. really, right? Mm -hmm. But what my mom did do, so especially when I started like, you know, high school, varsity, is I would say to her, all my friends are wearing Levi's jeans and I want a pair of Levi's jeans. And my mom would say, no problem. So here's um, your dad's salary. Here's my salary. Here are all of the expenses for the household. Do you still want Levi's jeans after you see that? <laughs> and my answer was just like, oh no, actually, I don't think. And it was such a good lesson for me as a, as, as a kid in terms of how I spend my money, right? And that do spoil myself. You know, if you go into my Instagram, you'll see I really do spoil myself. <laughs> but I do it in a way which takes into account the income bit of it, right? <laughs> like, and just, you know, so, so I think those were two really big mentors of mine. But I think coming into my career, um, and it's interesting when, you, you know, it's, it's women having a discussion, that my biggest mentor and impact was a Dutch guy called Case Kreitov, who from the onset, just from Varsity, he, he identified me um, with Unilever. They had an introduction to business management course, and they would take a couple of students across the country. 
and he said, I think she's fantastic, and he was the guy who brought me on board, set me up for success, gave me projects up front as a 21-year-old assistant brand manager on Rama, gave me a massive project, which meant I had to present to the exco, like as a young kid, so that's, that's around giving you, you know, opportunities. Um, so, and he, when I left Unilever, three years later, he called me and said, I want you to come back and be the category director at 25 for the T category. So he, He's a massive influence in my career and a mentor of mine to this day. Like, you know, he's back in um, the Netherlands, but I still call him and chat to him. And he didn't know me from a bar of soap until the day he met me at Vitz. I'm learning two or uh, more things from this. Yeah. Number one, that a lot of the inspiration can certainly come from very close at home mm. uh, and entrepreneurial activity. Mm. And a lot of the soft skills that we often regard within the business place really do work for you in your career as you grew to be mm. confident, right? And self-sufficient. And either you were an overachiever <laughs> or quite entrepreneurial <laughs> in your thinking because to grow that quickly in your career from age 21 to 25 certainly means yeah. that there was an extra amount of effort that you put in there. How Help us unpack that specifically for young professionals who are in corporate and might feel overwhelmed by having to be more productive, but at the same time understanding how increased productivity can translate into better outcomes when it comes to your career growth. Yeah, so I think um, you also, and it's not, it, it really is not about being arrogant. When I started at Unilever, I said I wanted to be a category director by the time I turned 30. Ah, so it was a goal and objective. I literally, I put it, and my friends who I was with all were like, ha, 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 right? Like, how I ambitious. Mean, how ambitious, and we're all young, and it happened. So I think that's the first thing is for me, being clear on what I want and you know what I'm looking for is really important. And, and you're not being honestly arrogant. And when you articulate it, and if people tell you, well, that's not going to have it, don't, don't worry about them. It's noise, honestly. I think the second thing was taking opportunities and asking for opportunities. So I think firstly, when I was given this first brick project, I took it and I ran with it, but I also asked for opportunities. So I could see, so I was an assistant brand manager on Rama, and the brand manager was moving off. And I, and I went and I said, I actually want to be the brand manager on RAM. And I was still a kid at that time. Like, it's only 18 months in the business. But I said, I actually wanted. I didn't get it at that time. Mm. But I already set up for people to understand that this is where her mindset is. She's not just wanting to be an assistant brand manager for however many years. She actually wants to progress. Um, and it's been like that generally. Like even for Sminoff, when I went to be Sminoff brand manager, I met the Sminoff brand manager. And I said to him, you have my job. I actually want that. That's quite bold. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so when he resigned, what did he do? He actually said, you know, I met this young lady and she told me that this is her job. So don't wow. you? So for me, I always believe in articulating what I want. And it's helped me even on money, by the way, and as women, right? We find that really difficult. What do you want yes. financially? I was about to ask yeah. how great are your negotiations? <laughs> you want to come there's, in there? there's something that comes up for me and it's called the power of yes. Mm -hmm. Saying yes intentionally and deliberately at specific times, not because you've got FOMO, but there's intention behind what you're talking about. And if I look at my own career, and most people see me as the speaker and the author and the media personality, mm -hmm. but I've had three different careers mm. because I said yes. Mm. And in fact, I started my career very early on. I worked while I studied. So in my early 20s, I was working full time in an agency environment, public relations and marketing and communications. And it was about saying yes to stuff that was bigger than me. Mm you know, at that point in my life. I, I remember being asked to speak at the Sun City Super Bowl at the age of 18 sure. to a thousand people. The pressure. That was way bigger than my <laughs> time. But my goodness, that's where my first job offer came. Mm. A director of a listed company came up to me and said, I want you to work on my account. Mm. And then doors open from there. So you've got to be, a, be, you've got to be prepared to put yourself out there and do tough stuff big stuff and say yes and learn how to do it mm -hmm. on the job. But that also means working quite hard, mm -hmm. um, getting out of your comfort zone and maybe doing extra long hours or doing an extra course. And when you said, said you know, knowing, you know, where you want to be, for me, you would also need to know your learning curve. Mm. I have a fast learning curve. Every 18 to 24 months, mm. I get bored because mm. I'm either at the end of the salary increase cycle or I can't learn from anybody else, which has been quite um, an interesting challenge working for myself 
okay, for 25 years. Makes sense. But prior to that, I found myself moving jobs in my 20s every two years. Mm. I so it, it's jobs. not necessarily being bored or unsatisfied. It's just that you've reached the mm. end of your learning curve and you need to recognize mm. that to pursue other opportunities. Exactly. But I would say to our young people who are watching today, because this is one of the issues. You will land up somewhere where things aren't feeling so comfortable. Mm. You might have a baptism by fire where somebody is pushing your buttons. And often with young millennials, young pros, they want to get out of their chop chop. Yep. Okay. And my, my caveat is don't leave before you learn. Mm. Don't leave before you learn. You might not get the promotion that you want, but what are you learning and how are you growing in that situation? Because you can have that mentor mm -hmm. who sees something in you, but maybe has a bad bedside manner. Doesn't uh -huh. know how <laughs> bedside to manner. You know, sorry. <laughs> bad, bad choice of words. Very but but doesn't know how to teach. I mean, I literally had somebody, and I think I was in my third or fourth job at that point who literally would put his pen through my press releases mm -hmm. and not tell me why they weren't good enough. And I was a good writer at that point. I even had awards for mm -hmm. writing. So what did you do to be proactive to actually learn from them versus just accepting the negative criticism? He used to send me back to my office to stew Ooh. in my own juice, <laughs> you know? And it was really tough. And I have to tell you that for two years, I got this pit in my stomach before I went to work every day. But he made me better than good. Mm. And somewhere along the line, you need somebody who's going to make you better than good, mm. who's going to make you sharpen your saw, because then you can write books like mm. I do. You know? <laughs> and so, you know, there are things that happen along the way that are unanticipated. Mm. Sometimes stay for a little longer. Don't leave until you've learned. Don't leave before you learn. Don't leave before you learn. And that's a very important part that we want to expand on. And we'll certainly deep dive into some of the consumer trends. And of course, negotiating for money, right? <laughs> Especially that's as women. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Especially as that's women. one that I want to bring up. But Bronwyn, you definitely can add uh, your thoughts to, to this particular part. Yeah. Because not only have we seen both Kenzie as well as Nikki, you know, um, leverage off of different career opportunities, but you've done exactly that. Just reading your bio, I said part-time economist, part-time princess, <laughs> part-time <laughs> strategist. And, and the likes and that really speaks to perhaps what we are seeing in terms of trends in of women in the workplace as well as the opportunities that we keen to explore so you've learned quite a lot i can imagine through the multiple <laughs> careers that you've had but help us unpack you know if this is becoming more of a trend people entering either the gig economy becoming entrepreneurial uh, and really expanding into the multiplicities of their skill set absolutely i think first just to pick up on what nikki was saying i think it's a very important point to say don't leave a job when you're uncomfortable leave it when you're comfortable so if you put it that way, you sort of understand why you're leaving. You're leaving to grow. You're not leaving because you're scared of growth. Yes. Right? So yes, I have actually changed my career quite a lot. But again, listening to what everyone was saying, all those different skills you pick up from all mm -hmm. the different roles you have all converge eventually onto what you're meant to be doing. So even if it sounds quite random at the time, you're going to collect all those threads together and make yourself unique and irreplaceable going yeah. forward. But in terms of trends and what's going on, particularly with women, it's quite interesting that according to SARS, a whole lot of the people that switched to freelance from salaried positions were actually women. Up to 80% of people making that move were women. Sure. Now, this is not necessarily because women are more ambitious than men. It's also because we have a different sets of responsibilities. There's different sorts of unfairness in our lives. If you talk about the sort of unpaid labor in the home, women spend 2.4 times as much doing that unpaid care work and home to care taking work in homes than what men do and unfortunately we've seen that trend deepen not reverse during the pandemic mm. because if mom and dad are both working at home and you do have children in the home then who is picking up the slack right who is shooing the children out the room when they're running in and interrupting the zoom call right yeah. it seems to be that we haven't necessarily found a way to rebalance those roles between the different genders in the home and unfortunately south africa is one of the biggest culprits there in fact our women mm -hmm. spend more time on average compared to men on care work compared to women in other countries yeah. so it is something that we need to look out for but at the same time, if you want to look at that from a more positive light, women have proven themselves to be more adaptable. So as I said, more women are taking on more freelance, more outcomes rather than salary based work. So side hustles. And yeah. Mm -hmm. So choosing freedom over security, because that's, of course, the trade off that we have to understand as young people. The sort of career you choose, the sort of job you sign up for, the sort of contract you negotiate, you have to understand that there is a trade off. 
but with more freedom comes less security. With more security comes less freedom. So on the freedom side, women often choose more on the freedom side so that they can raise families and start families. So even if you do have a completely woke husband or partner <laughs> to raise your child, biology does, you know, think things are not quite entirely so balanced, right? I mean, a female has to commit more, biologically speaking, to raising a child. So we do tend to often see young women choose freedom over security. This can hold us back on the career ladder if we're going to go for a very corporate career, but we can also see that as a, as a kickstart to become more entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. And that's a challenge for young women because one of the things that probably disturbs me a little bit is that although women are opting for freelancing or gig-based work, we still have far less female entrepreneurs, mm. which means we're not building wealth. We are just trading water. So if you are working as a freelancer, you don't have that security of a paycheck at the end of the month, which makes it harder for us to save. Women are highly undersaved in South Africa. In fact, our retirement replacement rates are just 21% of what we're earning right now on average, which is shopping. So shopping. for every hundred, what? Hundred yeah, so your, reti you your retirement years. replacement rate is how much of your current income you'll be able to live off after you retire. So generally financial planners say you don't have to go for a full 100% because obviously your expenses decline when you're retired. You don't have to maintain a car, you can live somewhere that's perhaps a bit cheaper. Yes. But you still should be aiming for at least sort of 70 to 80% of your income being replaced. Women only have a 20% replacement rate, 21% in fact in South Africa, which is very low. I mean, can you imagine cutting your living standards down to one quarter of what you have right now? That's all we've managed to save. And that's hugely unfair because we have a lot of female-headed homes in South Africa too. Women are spending more on just day-to-day -day survival on like that sort of continual treadmill. And we need to find ways to get off that to actually really build wealth over the long term. So that is something that what Nikki was speaking about earlier there too. We need to lay those foundations when we're young. We don't want to have that gap. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to catch up and succeed exactly. <laughs> over the course of our life. And that raises such a valid point. I'm uh, like, uh, yeah, shocked <laughs> by the data that you've actually shared, right? It's a lot to take in that yeah. actually women are pursuing freedom um, um, over security, but unfortunately we're not actually practicing the right elements of financial literacy. That's a theme that uh, you brought up, Nikki, and of course is being echoed here by Bronwyn, and also comes through as a question that we've uh, seen uh, from Zombuso. Uh, she asks, uh, financial literacy is very important, and I only realized that in my late 20s, that I wasted so many years and so much money because of ignorance and not mm. having a mentor. So where do I start saving, investing? And maybe let's start by negotiating the salary, right? Because <laughs> yeah. money needs to come in before I can distribute it into the various pots. I've struggled with this one personally. <laughs> So I, I, I'm not too it's sure where we're It's critical though. Exactly. It's critical because it compounds over time. Mm -hmm. You need to get that salary onto that ladder very early on in your career because it compounds. If you wait five years, you lose out on all that compounding of interest and that compounding of salaries. Yeah. That your first negotiation as a woman is critical and that's where women fall down compared to men. Men negotiate harder for jobs, right? So you'll have, if you negotiate harder... Without the perception of being the <laughs> difficult girl. that a um, compromising woman. Right. Right. Yeah, I can only speak from my experience, and I think I, I, I tend to find it, it just it helps, right? So when I was going on my expatriation, a very good male friend of mine was going on his expatriation. So Unilever put an offer on the table. I was like, oh, I'm going to Dubai, it's going to be nice, <laughs> and I signed the offer. Right. And then he was taking so long to sign the offer, and I just didn't understand what was going on. And he, so he said to me, no, I'm negotiating. I was like... What, you, what are you negotiating? Like they put an offer on the table. And he said to me, well, if you look at how they do our expatriation offers, there's a whole cost of living allowance based on the country, this side and that, blah, 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 all of that. Mm -hmm. I've actually, firstly, I'm negotiating at that basic level. How have you calculated the cost of living allowance? What's sitting in that basket of goods? Wow. Me, I just took it, whatever they told me. So then I was living in Dubai and I get to have dinner with the HR vice president, um, Tuelo, and I ask him to, you know, your point. So do you find men just negotiate much? And he said to me, well, yeah, you're a perfect example. You just signed. <laughs> he said, you just signed and went, you know? So I was like, and it, it was really difficult for me because in my head, I always felt like you must be fair, right? Whatever they pay me must be fair and mm -hmm. just, but I realized no, actually, and you can get more. So when I came back to South Africa and I joined South African breweries um, after taking my break, 
they put a, I'd never had a sign-on bonus. So they, they offered me a sign-on bonus. Let's say it was 10 Ryan, right? So sign-on bonus. So my initial reaction was, oh my God, this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened in my life. I'm signing. And this male friend of mine said, no, Don't. you're going to go back and you're going to ask for double it. And I was like, but I'm just so happy to get what is in front. He said, no, you're going to go back and you're going to double it. And then he said to me, which is my lesson that I use, what is the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is they say no, you still have 10 rand that they gave you, or you can get 20 rand, go back. Wow. So I went back and I said, actually, I need you to double this. And, and they said, yes. <laughs> I was like, so there was, and, and I guess- All you, you had to do was ask. Ask, and you need to start some, you can't, like, it, it might be scary, you might feel like, what am I, but you have to do it and you have to ask, and the worst that can happen is I'll say no. Yeah. Yeah, then, okay, then you know what's up, right? but you have to ask. I definitely want to expand on this, especially individuals in the corporate background and even those who might be working in the freelance space or the gig economy, because there, there really is no mm. gauge as to what value is. And that probably takes us back to when you sit opposite your peers and your colleagues at the table to substantiate your, your value and say, hold on, uh, Nikki, I'm with 20 rand, not 10. Yeah. Uh, Bronwyn, I'm with 25 <laughs> not 20. So how do we actually need to interpret that value, Nikki? And, and maybe if you can also share from your entrepreneurial perspective how that, that should be done. This is a really interesting topic because I had many jobs in my public relations career. Then I went into direct selling, which was a completely different. Oh, but everything's been linked with writing and speaking. Mm. Okay, that's been the common thread. And then the speaker, author, media personality. So those are the three careers. And um, the negotiation part when I was in my 20s was easy because I could justify my hours. It was an hours-based thing. Mm -hmm. And I used to go in with my timesheets at, at the end of every month. Remind us what I those are. <laughs> with our, our young the young people are not sure. timesheets. <laughs> so I used to get an increase at the end of every month. I negotiated myself an increase. I could prove it. It was fantastic. So there was that sense of worth. Um, but very interestingly, when I... Um, when I became a widow, which was at the age of 50, very, very unexpectedly, I realized that in my 30s and 40s, I'd become highly negotiable as a woman. Mm. And in fact, I've been doing a lot of work around this, and there's a, a YouTube video where I talk about how negotiable are you? Mm. And it was only when I was left a widow, sole breadwinner, single mother, uh, of, of young men, okay, they're in their um, sort of 18, 22, um, and I was negotiating with corporates to use my services extensively. And I would find myself sitting here as a woman with four men over there. And they would say, well, you know, and, and what will your fees be? Would you like to come back to us on your fees? And I'd say, no, I know exactly what I'm going to charge you for this. And before I'd even finished, they were saying, could we have a discount? Mm. And I remember having the presence of mind in that moment to say, well, in my head, I'm going, if I was a man, they wouldn't have asked me for a discount, number one. True. Number two, I just looked them in the eye and said, would you give me a discount on my premiums if I asked you to? Of course you would. <laughs> no, I am not negotiating a discount. This mm. is my value. I am providing something nobody else can do for you in my unique way. So I guess where that brings us in this conversation is how are you growing your value mm -hmm. every single day? How are you making yourself more valuable to the employer or to your clients? Which means you have to own your learning journey, you have to be filling your knowledge gaps, you have to be building your skills gaps to tap dance with all this disruption that's going on. Yep. You have to be prepared to plug yourself into a different place in an organization. And I think if you look at all of us, we actually are quite happy mm. working with change and we, we, we quite like mm. the change. We find it stimulating. Some people don't dance with change quite so much or quite so well, um, but this is the era we're living in. And I don't think that things are going to slow down. If you look at how we're living with the double disruption of COVID, the mm -hmm. global pandemic and the fourth industrial revolution, all the things that you've been talking about, Bronwyn. We need to put those adaptability shoes on, flexibility, and be bold and courageous enough to step out of that comfort zone. But every time you go somewhere, you're adding more bows to, to your quiver. Mm -hmm. And so it's that, how am I reinventing myself? How am I growing myself? And what do I need to do to be able to take advantage of the changing circumstances? Exactly. But you know what I love what Nick is saying, like around 
um, you're adding more bows to your quiver, right, is that's the bit I think as women sometimes we don't realize that's what we're doing. We then undervalue ourselves. So then we don't ask for what we deserve, right? Because um, for me, like there's two instances which I'd love, you know, the, the guys who are listening and, uh, you know, take it whichever way you want to take it. But let me tell you, firstly, when it comes to my salary, my friends know exactly how much I earn. And I'll tell you why, because... And that's already a first step, right? Because yeah, a lot of us train to keep it a Keep secret. it and we're trying to hide it, whatever. But what I learned was that actually I was being underpaid. The minute this guy friend of mine, and I said, here's how much I'm earning. And he said this, and I was like, I'm not going to swear here, but like, that's how I felt. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then it helped me. So I might, I didn't go back and say, well, I want to earn the same as Nikki, but it helped mm -hmm. me understand the value that I could get, right? And then work towards it and make sure that I've got the bows in my quiver to be able to ask for that. So that's the first thing. The second thing is something I did here at NetBank. And um, so when I got my first bonus and share allocation as a Group X member, I called my predecessor and I said <laughs> to him, so here's how much they're offering me. What do you think? And he said, I think the bonus is really good if I think of, you know, but I think you can get more on shares. Wow. And I went back to, you know, my boss and, you know, and I said, yes, what, and I want more shares. And again, using the, the worst he can say is, I've offered you 10 rand on shares, like, that's it. But he gave me more. So for me, I, and this whole thing of money, and you know, as a brand, we talk about it, like, stay money in the face, see money. This whole thing of, like, hiding the conversations about money mm. and keeping it secret, I actually think you're doing a disservice to yourself. Honestly, like, who, who are you trying to prove how much you earn? It's fine, like, you know. Right? But I think what's really important about what you've said is understanding what's behind the money. Mm -hmm. You know, how it's structured. Women tend to not ask mm -hmm. those questions. We don't dig. For some reason, it's, um, it's frowned on to, to ask questions. Yes. Like, who do you think you are? And I've just been through something very similar recently where I asked a lot of questions and the men involved said, but, you know, we feel like you're jostling for power. And, but wow. all I was wanting was to fill my knowledge gaps as to how this thing was structured. Mm -hmm. And I think if I'd been a man, that would not have been a question. Mm. So that's what you were alluding to, Bronwyn, that there is still this disparity out Definitely. there. But I think that shouldn't stop us from asking questions. And when it comes to money, whether you are male or female, we need to be encouraging young people to be putting that 20% of every paycheck away. away now because money grows over time. And don't touch it. Compound interest. Compound the eighth one of the world, <laughs> right? <laughs> the magic of compound interest. Exactly. And if you do that from now, you will be fine. And it's not about the qualification you've got. And it's not about the amount of money you earn. It's the discipline of making sure this is the money hack for, for today for me. Yes. Is, is to say, make sure you are disciplined enough to have that debit order, order that goes off your account and puts that money, pays your future self, mm. puts it in an account that's going to grow. And then you leave it and you get on with your life and you live now. And you were talking, Bronwyn, about living in the present, yes. mm. not in the past and not too far in the future mm -hmm. because we don't know. We're in the swirling mists of this pandemic. We can't see further than a couple of weeks down the line at the moment. A couple of weeks is even a luxury it's these even days. even a luxury. Maybe it's just a week, you know. And, and that's uncomfortable for us when we can't see and we feel out of control. Yes. And actually, we all need to get comfortable with feeling out of control. That was an illusion anyway. <laughs> Very true. And I do want us to come back to that in just a moment to really reflect on how it is that we should be upskilling ourselves and quite literally future-proofing ourselves, as is the title of your book. But I do see we've touched on quite a few questions. And um, uh, I see Nompumelelo as well learning a few lessons. Hashtag don't leave before you learn. Uh, and also addressing a question that came through from Nelly as to how to express your concerns, especially when you have added great value to your team and others. Um, and uh, you get the praise, but not necessarily some of the money. As has been mentioned, be very clear about the objectives you want to achieve in the organization. Uh, even tell those leaders within the positions that you want to occupy that, uh, look, I, I, I believe I'm the best candidate. And of course, work to it put towards the uh, necessary production and, of course, work that might be required. And most importantly, be sure to speak about how it is that you add value and make sure that that does translate into the financial rewards that need to come with that income. And, of course, keep 20% on the side, as Nick <laughs> mentioned. 
Exactly. And that also speaks to something quite interesting, right? Because we bring the money in, but then we also know you need to spend money sometimes to make money. I think all of us have had that experience in the last year. We have the luxury of being here in the NetBank headquarters. <laughs> but a year ago, we'd probably be in front of our laptops mm -hmm. with a lamp or a ring light in the front of us and um, a pretty background. And that also speaks to what it is that we're spending our money on. Uh, and Bronwyn, you alluded to some of the trends that women have been participating in in opting for freedom versus security, being uh, active uh, members of the gig economy and side hustles versus corporate jobs. But what are we spending on as women, as female consumers? Is it still the usual lipstick, shoes, <laughs> pretty wardrobe? Well, well, globally, we're spending on almost everything. I mean, when it comes to consumption decisions being made in the home, globally, 70 to 80% of all money spent is determined by women. Mm. But that's not to say that we necessarily have financial agency. Mm. A lot of that spending is on household goods. It's on mm. necessities. Unfortunately, we have to be realistic, as much as I'd like to say that it's all nice and rosy. When it comes to South Africa, seven out of 10 women are barely scraping by. Mm -hmm. But then we've had a, a pandemic. We've had many people that are out of work. And in fact, sort of two out of every three people that lost their jobs during the pandemic were women. Not necessarily because women were pushed out of the workplace, but also because many women have had to step out of the workplace to take on, again, caring roles, to look mm -hmm. after children who have not been in schools, and to make those sort of hard choices. Quite often families, if they are a dual income household, and if someone loses a job, or if someone is required to stay home and care for someone who is sick or small children, that would fall onto the women's role. So, you know, there's a, there's a whole lot of disparities that go on in those homes there. But when it comes to the spending question again, we have not actually seen increases in spending on all sorts of frivolous things. I think those articles that do talk about women spending sort of less responsibly than men are generally just quite a little bit insulting. <laughs> I think it's quite insulting. We all have our we all have our little things that we like to indulge in, but quite frankly, most people in South Africa are just spending money on the basic necessities, mm -hmm. just actually buying groceries. I mean, there were horrible statistics that came out even before COVID, saying that most people even earning high salaries, talking about people in that, those upper percentiles, earning over 750,000 Rand a year, mm -hmm. were buying things like groceries on credit that mm -hmm. were actually overspending and pre-spending bonuses that they weren't even guaranteed. Mm -hmm. This was prior to COVID. So we have quite a big problem there. I would like to put a bit of caution on, which is one of the more disturbing trends that we've tracked, and it's a money hack not to get onto the sort of red queen treadmill, like I like to say, and that we've seen a lot of apps offering people payday loans or buy now, pay later services. There's been a huge rush of this. And this is essentially really preying on vulnerable people, paying on people who are already overextended and giving you, as I like to say, training wheels for debt. Don't do that. Mm. Because once you're on that treadmill, you are always playing catch up. It's like you use your credit card once, that's great. But if you use it again, it starts costing you, right? You don't want to get sucked into those cycles. So be very, very wary of those debt training wheel services unfortunately we've seen a lot and they are being sort of hung as very sort of tempting things on a lot of clothing websites will say oh no you can get this now don't worry about it you'll pay it later but it does affect your credit score you don't want to get onto those services and the other thing that's probably something we should be aware of is again on the credit space also lots of trends where we're starting to see lots of fintech companies tapping into particularly women and asking them to trade their social credit for financial credit. Whoa. So this would be like a company called Tala is quite well known for it. And what they've done is they've targeted women because women are known to be more responsible than men. They literally have said this <laughs> on their press releases and they will give you micro credit. Again, that sounds great because it's giving you financial inclusion, but again, it's those debt training wheels. Mm -hmm. So we sort of trapping people into debt cycles. You have to understand the debt it's only your friend if it's being used to actually increase your wealth over time. Yes. Debt for consumption is no good. <laughs> like, like, don't do that, right? Rather try and live within your means. As you were speaking about earlier, that's what you really want to do. We have to be saving more. So as much as we might not be spending irresponsibly, if we're not saving, we're being irresponsible to our future selves. Exactly. I'm learning a lot from this because it really tells us that as women, not only do we have a lot of power and influence, as you say, we're more responsible with finances, uh, a lot more companies are looking to reach out to us in order to uh, make use of, of their resources but how are we as women within this generation actually capitalizing on that sense of power because that actually means I can influence which brands I mm -hmm. spend on whether or not I take out that loan if I redirect it to savings and investments if I self invest to actually make sure that I upskill and future proof myself for future jobs and roles uh, are we actually leveraging on, on that power 
Yeah, we are starting to see that. I think what's quite interesting, although South African women have more debt and less savings than men, we're also now buying more homes than men. So we're actually uh -huh. investing in our future. And for me, this is a really important trend. It's a, it's a signal as to a more empowered future because you have to be responsible to take on mm -hmm. something like a bond, mm -hmm. particularly in times like these. And to see that even though women earn less, have less in savings, but are still making those commitments, that's basically investing in yourself and investing investing in a stake in your own future. As I like to say, when it comes to the future, we have kind of two choices. We can sort of hedge against things that we don't want to happen, or we can invest in things that we do want to happen. And every time a woman buys a house, she's investing not only in herself, but also in her community. She's putting money into our land, into South Africa, mm -hmm. and saying, I'm invested here. Yep. She could have also made the choice to take the money offshore or to immigrate, right? And then she would have increase the odds of South Africa's economy failing, right? So yeah. I think it's really empowering to see women investing physically in our land, in our society. It says that we believe in our future. That's, that's a really positive, optimistic thing to do, but it also accelerates the odds of our whole community growing when we see women doing that, much like if you see women investing in a business. Mm -hmm. Whatever you put your money behind, your time, your attention behind, you increase the odds of that succeeding. So I think that's a positive signal in amongst all the sort of more negative <laughs> trends that we've been talking about. Very true. It is a great positive signal and also one that um, comes about when we reconsider what ownership really is for this younger generation because a lot of young professionals perhaps don't want to own cars because they can use e-hailing right. services. Mm -hmm. Others prefer not to own property because they choose to rent or be free again. Freedom exactly. over security, like right? <laughs> Exactly. Adaptability. It's a trade-off. Being nimble <laughs> because of change. It's yeah. actually Precisely. a trend. It's yes. a huge trend around the world that people are buying l less property and, and fewer cars. Because mm -hmm. why, do, why do you need, if you've got a car, you've got to pay insurance. Mm -hmm. You've got to pay garaging if you don't have a home. You know, all of those things. Mm -hmm. yes. So one actually does have to cut one's coat according to one's cloth, which you were alluding to. Mm. And if you don't have the money to buy a car, it would be better to invest in property and buy property and, and not a car because that's going to give you better long-term yeah. return and it's a bit better asset and it's not a depreciating asset, you know, exactly. all those things. So that brings me to say we always have the power to choose. Mm. Every single one of us, it doesn't matter how bad things are, there is always the opportunity to choose what happens next. So you choose your future in every little moment, in mm. every baby step. Don't get you know bogged down by that big picture that's so far away that you can't see through the mist right now. But when you are in the situation that we're all in right now, where we've never been here before, it's yes. about the next step, and then the next, and then the next. Don't worry about the hundred steps. Worry about the next two or three exactly and make the best possible choice you can right now in this moment with the information that you have and then trust yourself to make the next and ask a lot of questions along the way yeah. so make more informed decisions and don't be afraid to look stupid there was never a stupid question mm -hmm. you know even if you think people are going to think you're <laughs> stupid empower yourself with the information and we have to be so careful as women not to feel a paralyzing sense of guilt mm -hmm. or worrying about what are they going to think about me. Precisely. We've got to protect our future because, as they say, um, a man is not a plan. You know? <laughs> and I know that sounds we like often hear really, that. You know, a, a weird thing to say, but if you want to be empowered in relationships, whether you're in a relationship with a man or a woman, mm. every individual needs to have their own financial plan. Mm. And so many women don't. And if you want choice in your life, in your relationships, yep. or in your business negotiations, you have to know your financial position. Exactly. Actually, and your life plan and your financial plan actually go together. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you mentioned that because, I mean, just a moment ago, earlier you uh, alluded to Kinsani uh, having to come back home and at the age of 32 moving in with your parents. So again, adapting your plan, cutting your coat according to your cloth, uh, and uh, not necessarily comparing one's uh, financial position to that of another person, but really making it work for you in your individualistic capacity. I've just taken a look at the time and I'm actually quite shocked that we only have <laughs> five minutes left. Uh, but I do realize we've managed to address quite a few of your questions but I do want to uh, uh, um, make mention of just a few. Charmaine Rousseau, who's uh, shared a question saying she's 28 years old and she has a question as to what is more important, paying off debt or saving? 
Um, and I think there's a number of examples that we've certainly offered here, Shane, in terms of uh, how best it is that you need to uh, uh, find a plan that does work for you. But as has been mentioned by Nikki and a few of our other speakers, start off with a financial plan and take on debt that you know will help you accumulate wealth in the future. That's certainly one that we touched on. Ritumetsi Rakhoho uh, sent a question, how do you navigate in South Africa with the high unemployment rates, mm -hmm. especially at an entry level? How much room do we have to negotiate when we, it's been said that you need to be grateful for what you have, uh, your job or the current offer? I think that's a very important one that we need to allude to as we start with our concluding remarks here. We're trying to future-proof ourselves, upskill ourselves in self-investment, but yet the reality of the environment that we're in is not very favorable. Mm -hmm. Words of encouragement, and I guess practical tools and steps. Nikki, I'm happy for you to lead this, and Bronwyn, certainly feel free to add in um, as to how it is that we need to future-proof ourselves, even in the midst, as you said, of confusion, anxiety, and a lack of certainty of the environment mm. we're in. So I think that word pivot is a, is a big word at the moment. So being prepared to do maybe work that you weren't expecting to do. Where can you add value to mm -hmm. the client? If you can't... Um, if you want to ask for more money, sometimes you have to pad what you're offering and add more value. So if you want to hold the price that you're going in at, what else can you bring to the table? Yes. And so we go back to the bows in the quiver. What is in mm -hmm. that quiver? And, and to keep upskilling yourself. Um, the world is changing so fast. So own that learning journey. And then you have to package that into what I call a talent profile. Some young professionals at the moment are going, but what about our career trajectory? You know, throw my hands up. I'm such a victim. You know? Yes. <laughs> and, and I think that that needs to be addressed. This is the perfect time for self-mastery. This is the perfect time to start um, collating all your stories around the X factors for success. Resilience, creativity and innovation. Um, so, so when you are next in an interview, do you have stories for mm -hmm. us? How do you operate in a team virtually and in the real world? What do you bring to the table? What's your gift? Mm. Knowing yourself really well. So for me, I would be going and, and recording those X factors for success. I would be putting them into a talent profile, which is a multimedia CV, mm -hmm. so that you are like in technicolor. When you are pitching for a job, it's not just... Mm. On this talent profile, can we find one online uh, so that we can populate and put together to make our lives easier? In my book. Okay. Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. Pranam, you're keen to add? And yeah. of course, can see your, your, your thoughts. I wanted to pick up on that question that you went read through earlier, where she was saying, if I'm young, how do I negotiate when we have such a labor surplus and there's yes. so few jobs? But there's a flip side to that, and that mm -hmm. is there are actually very few, very good employees yeah. out there. Mm -hmm. And that's where your value is. If you can prove that you're one of them, you can essentially write your own check. In fact, if you are looking at the future of employment from a sort of futurist perspective, the future is quite unfair. It's unfair in that the difference between the best and the rest in every career is separating. In the future, like all careers are like rock star careers, where unfortunately the people who are the very best can command essentially whatever they want to command, but everyone else has to compete for much more automatable positions. Mm. You don't want to find yourself on that side mm. of the field. But understand there's very little competition at the top. There's a lot of competition at the bottom. So like Nikki was saying, you know, you've got to make sure that you are one of the best. But if you are one of the best, you'll be able to write your own checks. Yeah. Yeah. You're a rock star of your career. As I agree mentioned. with that, actually. And uh, from a corporate perspective, like I always if I talk, think about two different individuals, right, in corporate, mm. you've got someone who's constantly complaining, telling you that I can't see my career trajectory, I'm not being paid enough, blah, blah, blah. Then you've got another individual who says, Kenzie, I see that you're trying to do this and it's not really in my day-to-day -day job description, but I'd love to get involved. Kenzie, I see that you're trying to drive a particular culture within the organization. Mm -hmm. I want to be a culture champion. What can I do? Uh -huh. can, those are the people who, by the time we're having conversations about, you know, your your value in terms of where you're going to go in your career how much my i'm looking at the second person i'm not looking at the person who's constantly moaning and can't see opportunities and and for me when i then have to sit and go oh okay i've got a marketing executive job available who do you think i'm going to give it to makes sense the person yeah. who's eager who's optimistic who's shown that they're hungry for that position yeah. Yeah. nikki you wanted to add very briefly yeah, before I we think, wrap up i think what kinsani is saying is um you know, if you help others 
get what they want, you will get what you want. Yeah. And if you want to travel far, travel together. <laughs> and just to sum up everything, I think really we need to build ourselves as brands of one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because what you're talking about, what Bronwyn's talked about, is the rock star mm -hmm. has built themselves as an identifiable brand of one, which speaks to the talent profile. Just start building a website for yourself mm. and treat yourself as Brand Me Inc., Brand Bronwyn, mm -hmm. Brand Gugu, Brand Kinsani, because you will make different decisions if you treat yourself as a business than you would if you treat yourself as an individual, particularly as women. We are better negotiators for other people than we are for ourselves. So start consulting to yourself as if you were a business. Brand me. And it changes everything. Mm. Oh, very true. I think quite a lot of solid points that we've certainly heard here this afternoon. And of course, we are seeing the feedback that many of you are sharing with us as well on social media using the official hashtag NetBankYoungPro. I myself am truly inspired yeah. and uh, have learned a lot from this particular conversation. And great to see that Sadreen also shares the same, same sentiments, saying a truly awesome conversation. And I've enjoyed every minute. Fantastic pearls of wisdom from each of the guests. But well, we're really grateful, Sadreen, that uh, like many of your colleagues and peers, you've joined us for this conversation. And really she's in my team. Oh, she is? <laughs> oh, there's a special shout out for you there, Sadreen. <laughs> have you put your hand up for promotion, Sadreen? <laughs> right? That should be something that we should consider but of course it really does speak to uh, many of the money hacks and life hacks that we've shared with you here today number one it's important to be very self-aware understand what it is that you want and what you don't want and that will certainly help you in terms of navigating your career and of course financial trajectory speaking of financial trajectory it's important that as you build up your life plan that you have a financial plan to go in hand in hand with that that will give you clarity as to uh, whether or not to take out debt what kind of debt to take out is it helpful you improve in terms of your business or building the kind of credit profile that will unlock future opportunities for you as you expand and grow within your career and how it speaks to the kind of life that you want to live and experience also be clear to articulate what it is that you want your goals your objectives within the organization that you work for or even within your entrepreneurial activity Yes, you might have a side hustle, but be mindful of actually understanding how best you can scale that into a sustainable business that can operate independently of your own operations. Speaking of that, always make sure that you actively participate in the money conversation and add tax as you uh, might be at it, but making sure that you are quite clear in terms of how you offer value and how that value will be remunerated to you for the services or the goods that you're able to deliver. And most importantly, as has been mentioned here before, uh, make sure that it's clear, honest and open communication, add value, make other people's lives better, and that in itself will translate into making sure that you too uh, do reap the rewards of the investment you've made into other individuals. But start with self. Future-proof yourself, self-investment is where it comes from, and uh, of course the growth will compound from there going forward. It's been an absolute pleasure being with all of you here today, including my guests. I've certainly gained a few nuggets, yeah, and I'm sure fantastic. that our audience has too. We're really quite appreciative of your time, as well as the insights you've shared with us here today. Thank you so much, not only to uh, Bronwyn Williams, but of course, uh, Kenzie, uh, who joined us as well from NetBank, and of course, Nikki Bush, giving us some insight into uh, how best we need to implement these money hacks in our lives. And to you, our NetBank young professionals, we wish you the greatest success. Uh, let go of the anxiety and continue to pursue opportunity even in the midst of all this confusion. Ask for help where need be and most importantly, continue breaking barriers, building up uh, new uh, hustles that you can develop and of course, expanding on your growth in being NetBank Young Professionals. Until next time, it's been great being with you. Take care and goodbye. <laughs>